Hey everyone, welcome back for more Bio 20. We're now in a new week, it's week number 10. We're past the halfway point. We're gonna start pivoting into some stuff that's a little bit more relevant in the world, but it's still gonna be chemical in nature. So for this week, we're gonna look at some more advanced inheritance. Not necessarily to work the problems, but to just know that it's out there. We're then gonna look at DNA and RNA, and then we're gonna call it quits because we're going to then utilize that next week. In terms of the assignment, it's one that you might not want to wait till the last second. You're going to be creating a video due Saturday, and you may submit it as either a pair or as an individual, whichever one you want. I'll, I'll point it out at the end of this bit here on advanced inheritance. It's like a halfway point assignment. It's not going to do with DNA or RNA at all, although it will, but it doesn't. In lab, we're going to look at meiosis, which will be pretty simple and straightforward. The, the problem that will show up in lab is going to be the inheritance patterns, so we're going to work more problems. You're going to be turning in the lab solo. So this week is going to have five videos. Part one is just going to deal with advanced inheritance, meaning it's not as simple as doing a simple Punnett square. And then part two is going to be some molecular biology. So here, we should know that one and two genes can violate Mendel's law. So we know that um, there are three alternatives to Mendel's dominant and recessive traits. You can, if you're given information, you can solve some non-Mendelian genetics, give some examples of epistasis and pleiotropy, and explain how sometimes inheritance isn't always genetic. When we think about Mendel's laws, we tend to think of things that are just simple genes that are either dominant or recessive. You have a hitchhike, you either have a hitchhiker's thumb or you don't. You have a widow's peak or you don't. You have freckles or you don't. Well, what if that's not always the case? When if that turns out to be the case, then we can actually get far more complicated bits of of biology going on. One such example is what we would call incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is when it's not one is dominant and one is recessive. For example, when we have blood type, you can have type A, you can be type B, but you can also be type AB. You try to be both. This actually turns out to be an example of me jumping the gun to what we would call being co-dominant. An example of being incomplete dominant would be something like Carnations. So carnations are flowers. And if you were to cross a white carnation with a red carnation, you don't get red or white, you get pink. And pink is kind of a blending between white and red, which is what incomplete dominance is. You get a blending. It's not one trumps the other. You, you get neither the dominant nor the recessive. Co-dominant would mean that one is not dominant to the other, they just are both fully expressed. So if you have type AB blood, you have full-blown type A, and you have full-blown type B blood. You also run the risk of having, or not risk, risk is the wrong word, but you can also have traits that have more than two choices, where it's not just one is dominant to the other. You can have it where there's actually a series of four or five or six choices. And some of them are co-dominant, some of them are incompletely dominant, some of them are dominant and recessive. So we can get combinations of everything. When we look at blood typing, blood typing with AB, there's also a type O. This turns out to be possible because we have three alleles, the A, the B, and the O allele. So three alleles gives us four different options for phenotypes. When we look at rabbits, rabbits can turn out to have cases where they could have black fur or brown fur or they have white fur, but sometimes they have white fur with like black splotches on it. And that w gives us a series of interactions and we call those allelic series. And that's well beyond what we need to talk about in here. So for example, Snapdragon petal coloration is controlled by a single gene R. It's incomplete dominant with those three phenotypes and genotypes. What's the phenotype ratio if you cross two pink snapdragons? 
So two pink snapdragons would be big R, little r, plus big R, little r. So I make my Punnett square, big R, little r, big R, little r. I fill in the Punnett square, where again, I have to use all my options when filling it in and you can see that follows a pattern I mean, yeah I'm switching it back and forth but it doesn't matter because big R little R is the same thing as saying little R big R what have you so what do we turn out to get well one of the four turns out to be red which is big R big R so that's this one this one here turns out to be one of the four is white little R little R the other two, which is two of the four, which is half, are going to be pink. Big R, little r. So our ratio would be, in a sense, one to one to two. Or you could also say one to two to one. It all depends on what you want to say. So here this is one to one to two. Big R, big R, little r, little r, big r, little r. And right is a key for an AVO blood system. You have a mom who's type A, father is type B, children is type O. Where are the parents' genotypes? So to get that, mom is type A, dad is type B. So it turns out when we look at being type A, which is here, here, and here, I can either be homozygous or heterozygous. Same thing for being type B, I could be homozygous or heterozygous. But if you're type O, there's only one choice. That is little i, little i. The only way that's possible is if this little i came from dad and this little i came from mom. So what do their parent genotypes have to be? They both need to be heterozygous. There's other things that can go on too when we look at genetics. One such example is what we call epistasis. Epistasis is a weird idea and this deals with genes interacting with others. So an example of this would be if I look at corn. Corn, if you look at it, can actually have multiple colors. It can be white, it can be yellow, it can be red, and it can be purple. The white and the yellow is looking inside of the corn kernel, whereas the red and the purple is a, is a coloration on the outside of the corn. So if you are coloring the outside, meaning you color the outside of the corn red or purple, it doesn't matter what's going on inside. If the inside is yellow or white, I would not know because the outside of the corn kernel is colored and that's all I get to see. That is what we mean by genes interacting or influencing what we get to see. So and a famous example deals with blood typing. So we see A, B, and H, or A, B, and O. But there's another factor that we call H. H has to do with the ability to make you A or B. So if you're type O, the way that we say that is you are II. There is another way, however, and that is you need to be AA or AI or BB or BI or AB and HH, little h, little h. What this will turn out to mean is you cannot put the cell marker of A or B on the cell. When this turns out to happen, we refer to it as the Bombay phenotype, which is kind of, I, I don't know the history of why it's called Bombay phenotype. It's probably discovered in Mumbai, which is used to be called uh, Bombay. But what you end up getting 
is your genetics say you should be this, but you get a different phenotype because it turns out another gene is preventing these other genes from being expressed. We can also see it here with this example with some mice. So we have some two brown mice, or what we would call goody mice. If I were to cross them, what we end up getting would be some that are brown mice, we get some black mice, and we get some albino mice. But if I look at the ratios, I expect it to be a 9, 3, 3, 1 ratio, but I don't get that. I actually get four albinos, three blacks, and nine agouti. What this is telling me is one gene is somehow messing up the expression of another gene. We should get four phenotypes, but we're only getting three because one gene is messing with another combination. We don't need to be able to explain how this works out. It's just worth noting that it's not always as simple as we want it to be. Another example of that is what we call pleiotropy. So pleiotropy is when one gene is going to give you multiple phenotypes. The most famous example of this, most likely, is sickle cell trait. So sickle cell trait has to do with hemoglobin. And hemoglobin comes in a few varieties. We have an adult hemoglobin, we have a fetal hemoglobin, and we have an abnormal hemoglobin. If you have two copies of the abnormal hemoglobin, what this results in is sickle cell disease. If I have one copy, you get what's known as sickle cell trait, which sometimes is bad, but it also prevents you from getting malaria, which is good. So you're kind of normal, but you're kind of not normal, and you're immune to malaria. We're getting multiple things that result from this one gene. Another famous example of this is achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism. It turns out to be a dominant disorder or condition. It's not really a disorder. You can survive just fine with it. But the result of this is if you are heterozygous, you just happen to have a short body. So your limbs are shorter than normal because achondroplasia means you don't make body limbs or you have a difficult time making them. If you know who the actor Peter Dinklage is, he's a famous example of someone who has this. We can look at him and tell you immediately, oh, let me tell you what his genotype is. It's big A, little a, if we want to use A's. If you turn out to be homozygous for this condition, meaning big A, big A, there's a second phenotype that shows up, and that is it's lethal. There is no one ever born who is big A, big A, because it turns out there's a second phenotype with achondroplasia, and it's death if homozygous. There are some other bits and pieces that have been coming into play that are weird that are starting to show up more and more and usually I hold off and I don't include this in this course but it's okay I guess I need to. And one such idea is what we call epigenetics. And epigenetics is when the environment is starting to mess with how your inheritance works. So this gets a little molecular in the weeds, but just kind of sort of hear me out. So it exists in these two different states, condensed and loose. It turns out when your chromosomes are really tightly bound together, they can't really express anything, meaning you don't get really phenotypes from the genes. But when they're loose, we do happen to get phenotypes. Genes are going to do what the genes get to do. It turns out the environment can mess with whether or not you are in a loose or a condensed state. We do not, we understand the mechanisms, meaning we know how to turn DNA or chromo chromosomes into the loose state or the tight state. We don't know what the triggers are to make it do one or the other. So there's an example referred to as the Dutch hunger winter that happened during World War II. And I want to read a bit of it to you. So as a result of this thing, so what happened, World War II was going on, there's a cohort of people who are all pregnant around the exact same time. And they there was a starvation period where there's no food, 
They're all in gestation at the same time. All of them are starving, which means their fetuses are starving all at the exact same time. They're all being stressed out the same time of the year, during development, etc. Here's what they found afterwards, meaning not a year later, but this is decades later. So males and females exposed at any age or at any stage in utero, meaning while they were developing, put them at higher risk for being a type 2 diabetic and for having heart disease compared to the normal people. So the children were more at risk for these two very not good diseases. Exposed females grew up to have more children, give birth to twins more often, and be less likely to remain childless and start having children at a younger age than those who did not experience the hunger winter. Females exposed in early gestation had increased prevalence of breast cancer, higher cardiovascular mortality, higher cancer mortality, and breast cancer mortality. By the age of 63, women, but not the men, exposed to the famine in early gestation had an overall higher mortality rate compared to unexposed 63-year-old women. Children whose mothers were in utero during the famine were heavier at birth, while those fathers exposed in utero were heavier in adult life suggesting different epigenetic influences according to the sex of the parent. At age 58, both men and women exposed to the famine in early gestation had poor cognitive function. Males exposed to famine in early gestation had a higher risk of neurodegenerative disease, and males exposed to famine in early gestation reported higher or more symptoms of anxiety and depression. This is all stuff that happened while they were developing. What this doesn't go into, this what I was reading, this came from the Moore Institute, which is part of uh, Oregon Health Sciences, is if you kept going and you started looking at the grandchildren, they were also affected. So something that happened to them before they were born affected them and the grandchildren. And I would be surprised if it affected their great-grandchildren too. So this is not good. The reason why this is of importance to us is there are traits that exist that are simple, but they have some follow weird some follow they follow some weird patterns. We have other traits that exist that use many genes. They aren't simple, and some of them the environment doesn't or the environment plays a bigger role than what the genetic than what the genetics seem to be. We have actually somewhat know this because you know that if you have tall parents, that doesn't necessarily predict you're going to be tall. There's plenty of people who have very tall parents and they turn out to be much shorter than their parents, or you are much, much taller than your parents. We actually can measure this in a graph. So this is a regression line. And what we could do is measure something called the R squared value, which tells you how nicely it matches. If you get an R squared equals 1, we say that you are exhibiting perfect heritability, meaning you are perfectly matching genes and what results. That is not always true. When we have polygenic traits, meaning more than one gene involved, the environment tends to play a role. How many genes are involved with how tall you are? How many genes are involved with how smart you are? How many genes are involved with your athleticism? How many genes are involved with your resistance to disease like, or susceptibility to disease? There's, there's a lot, which means figuring out the inheritance is not easy. These tend to be the traits that people think that they can engineer into others, and that's, that's, just not, that's not a thing because they're too complicated. And that's the point. Advanced genetics is this is harder than what you have been taught. It is not as simple as what you want it to be, which means if you try and speak with authority, you need to be mindful that you're probably wrong. The last topic that we're going to look at for advanced inheritance is the idea of linkage. That is genes traveling together.